Uttar Pradesh Foundation is happy to present uh, the webinar series on the brain functions by Dr. Amit Chaudhary, who is a chief neurology resident at Anaheim, California. Uh, Uttar Pradesh Foundation is engaged for since the pandemic and doing a lot many activities last year. Uh, not last year, especially this year, we, uh, you know, collected or uh, raised fund and, uh, you know, sent 35 machines to India, including 20 ventilators and 15 oxygen concentrators. Other than that, we uh, run various programs and events. And I'm very happy uh, that uh, Amit uh, uh, agreed uh, in his busy schedule to guide us onto this very different topic, on a, especially in a brain. Uh, Amit is committed uh, to taking care of people with neurological disorders. Uh, <clears throat> he completed uh, his AAAS policy fellowship at the National Institute of Health and preliminary year in internal medicine at UCSF Prenso. He currently serves as a chief neurology resident at the University of California. Erwin. Uh, Amit has received several awards and, and uh, funding grants for his research in stroke, uh, neuro ICU, and neuro interventional radiology. His recent clinical work focuses on using minimally invasive medical devices to treat very sick patients in the neuro ICU, neural ICU, and enhance their quality of life. Above all, Amit enjoys collaborating with patients, caregivers, and advocacy organizations to improve the care of for people with neurological disorders in our nation. <clears throat> uh, so, thank you, Amit, for uh, you know accepting this uh, invitation. I know Amit uh, since his childhood; uh, uh, he's a son of our co very close, close friend, and I've seen him. So, he's not only medically, uh, you know, professional or, or so, also scientist, but also, uh, you know, spiritually enlightened or, you know, on the path of a spirituality person. So, so I think I always feel it's the right mix and combination. So thank you. Uh, for, thank you, Amit. And thank you everyone for joining this uh, event or meeting. Uh, now Amit is, uh, it's all yours, the mic and desk. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so thank you again for this really, really amazing introduction. Um, oh, it says the host is disabled screen sharing, if you don't mind uh, enabling screen Sorry sharing. Sorry, yeah. Okay, okay. Right, fantastic. Um, okay, I think you should be seeing the slides, hopefully. Yes. And I can just minimize this so you don't see that totally. Okay, I might have to close my camera because there's some um, some sure. videos that I want to show, but uh, let me see how we can do that. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so uh, thank you again for this introduction. Again, um, I've I've known you from and and Sunitanti for so long. And, you guys really, really have been a huge inspiration to me and, and my parents always talk about it. So it is such an honor to be invited by you here today. Um, today, I want to talk about the question of becoming digitally immortal by 2045. And this talk is uh, part three of the three part series on brain functions by the Ether Day Foundation. Um, I hope you were able to join the previous two. But if you are attending for the first time, we extend a very special welcome to you. Um, to learn more about the series or the Other Day Foundation, you can visit otherdayfoundation.org. And to learn more about me, you can visit amitchaudhuryamd.com. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as at amitchaudhuryamd. Um, and I hope I'll be able to connect with you on all of those platforms. So, sorry, just a heads up. Um, this talk is a little long, uh, but hopefully it's a fun. And I hope you'll be able to stay for the full talk and that you find it a little bit interesting. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end. So if some questions do come to mind, uh, please remember them or write them down. And we can, of course, discuss them later. 
Uh, and before we begin, like, like every time, I just have a small request. Will you please keep your microphone off for the entire duration of the talk? Um, and then, of course, we'll open it to questions at the end. So we start with this quote, um, dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die today. Uh, it's a very famous quote, very motivational, inspiring. But what if you did not have to die today? What if you did not have to die at all? Right. Who wants to live forever? Um, I don't see your cameras, but I'm assuming everyone's hand is up. Otherwise, why would you be here? Who wants to live forever? And it turns out everyone does. But the world doesn't belong to people who want things. For example, who wants to be the, the owner of a company larger than Apple or make more money than Warren Buffet? Lots of people want things but very few people believe that they can actually achieve those things, like truly believe to the point where every cell and every thought and every second thinks and works constantly to make that belief a reality. So let me ask you the same question again. Who believes that you can live forever? Who believes that you can live forever? You, personally, you can live forever. Everyone wants to, but be honest with yourself. Think for a moment. Do you believe that you can live forever? Do you believe that you will be there when the iPhone version 135 comes out? Or you'll be able to travel to Mars and other galaxies? That you will see your children's grandchildren's grandchildren's 100th birthday? Do you believe it? You might say, it doesn't matter what I believe, there's evidence that we all died. Everyone I know has died. Everyone who ever was born in this world so far has died. Even the son of God, Jesus Christ, has died. And so is the enlightened Buddha. They're all passed away. So if immortality was possible, of course, these great saints would have access to it, right? So how can I live forever when they're dead? It's just impossible. And if this is you, if you're thinking this way, I'm just going to say, keep an open mind. Because you may change your opinion. Actually, you may even get inspired enough to make living forever possible. And we start the story of living forever with Amrit. We humans have been obsessed with this idea of immortality for thousands of years, the idea of Amrit. In the picture on the right, what you see is a famous scene from uh, the Rig Vedas. Thousands of years before humans could read or write, we were communicating, we were writing poems, we were writing the Vedas. And in it, we were discussing ideas. One of the very first ideas that we discussed was immortality. In this picture, you see a story where there's a great war between the benevolent devas and the crude asuras. They're both fighting to obtain Amrit. It's a potion that will make them immortal. In the center of the picture, you see Mohini, or the female avatar of Lord Vishnu. She is giving Amrit to the devas. And near the foot, you see the wretched snake dragon Rahu, who tried to steal the Amrit. He now lays there with his head cut off. Now, humans have been in existence for about 10,000 years. And many scholars say that the concepts outlined in the Vedas and in these paintings started almost at the same time that we became human. So imagine for a second that you were a person of that time, maybe five or 10,000 years ago, an ancient time where knowledge of the Vedas was prevalent and discussions on the spirit and meditation and samadhi and God were all commonplace. Imagine at that time, if someone came up to you and said, hey, I created a device where you can watch reruns of Tarak Mehta Ka Ulta Chashma on YouTube or talk to people thousands of miles away on Zoom, or go to Mars. You would think that guy belongs in a mental hospital. So many things have changed in the last five, 10,000 years. 
But our belief in immortality, our desire to live forever, they have been exactly the same. We were looking for Amrit back then, and we're still looking for it now. And by the way, it wasn't just us. It was all over the earth. In the top left picture, you see one of the very first pieces of art ever created by mankind. It is a picture of a mythical white rabbit man creature from ancient China. And he's stirring a pot of liquid that contains what's called the elixir of life. Drinking just one drop, it was believed, would make you completely immortal. The same idea you see thousands of miles away, documented on the picture on the right of it, the little tablet. This tablet was inscribed by hand around 2100 BC or 4,000 years ago in ancient Mesopotamia or what is today Egypt. In it is the story of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is a famous king who really oppressed his people. The story goes that the gods became very angry with Gilgamesh because of his brutality and then sent a mythical creature called Enkido to stop him. However, Gilgamesh and Enkido ended up becoming friends. So, angered, the gods killed Enkido and saddened beyond grief at the loss of his friend, Gilgamesh undertook a long and perilous journey to discover the secret of eternal life. He was a very famous king. He had everything in this world. He went and fought with the lower gods and he tried to find the secret of eternal life. As the story goes, however, he eventually learned that this is not possible. And the text famously quotes, Life which you look for, you will never find. Life which you look for, that is eternal life, you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his share, and life was withheld within their own hands. Essentially, gods are the only ones that can be immortal, but human life is meant to die. And again, 4,000 years ago, people are writing this, right? But of course, that doesn't mean that we stopped looking. The picture at the bottom was painted around the 1400s, just around the time when Columbus discovered the New World or the Americas. During that time, there were many people like Columbus who sailed the seas. And one of them was a Spanish um, conquistador or, or sailor who was named Ponce de Leon. He was famous in Spain and he was conquering lots of lands in Florida and the Caribbean um, and everywhere where Native Americans lived. And there's a legend that he, with the Native Americans, went around Florida and the Caribbean and was looking for the ultimate fountain of youth. A fountain where if you took a bath, you would stay young forever. This picture from the 1400s imagines what that fountain would look like. It shows the aristocrats of the day in, in Spain coming and bathing in this one fountain and then remaining forever young. So all this I just put out there to illustrate that what I'm talking to you about immortality is not new. It's been there for thousands of years. The ideas have been there for thousands of years. But needless to say, Hans de Leon, nor anyone else, has ever found a fountain of youth. No one has ever found that rabbit man. No one found Mohini. No one has found Amrit. And what I believe that people have not found this, it's not because people were not trying, but it's because for centuries upon centuries, we were just looking in the wrong place. This is your human brain. 
you know, you see the classic picture in your textbooks, maybe you saw it on TV. Those pictures are a little bit outdated. This is the true human brain. This is what we see in the newest imaging technology. It's not just a blob of tissue, but it's an interconnected network of cells that share thoughts and ideas with each other at the speed that's very, very close to the speed of light, it's incredibly fast. These connections are what make you, you. <clears throat> your likes, your dislikes, your personality, your love, your everything about you is based on these connections. And when your body, your physical body, your heart, your liver, your skin, when all of these things age, <clears throat> or when they get diseased, or go through other things, you see that these connections start to vanish. And when they vanish, that's when you die. We talked about life and death earlier. You don't die because your heartbeat stops beating. You die because these connections start to vanish. And the way that these connections work, unfortunately, there is no liquid or potion or berry or fountain of youth or ancient herb or any other random substance that's hidden somewhere on earth that we can just drink and have these connections last forever. There's no liquid, no potion, no random herb that we can just drink and become immortal. You simply cannot preserve these connections that way. You simply cannot preserve your identity. You cannot preserve your consciousness that way. You see, Amrit is not going to be something we find in a lake somewhere or something that a person makes in a jar. Amrit is something we will make in a lab with technology and biomedical engineering. Amrit is not something that we're going to find. It's something we will make in a lab with technology and biomedical engineering. Already you see on TV, you see in your pharmacy market, there's so many anti-aging creams and pills that are becoming available on the market. Huge scientific labs from cosmetics to rehabilitation to the military are devoting billions of dollars to creating this elixir of life. And all of this does not even include the hidden research that goes on in countries like Korea or Russia. I have no doubt that one day, fairly soon, we will have some form of a, whether it's a drink or a pill or something that can stop the aging process. We will understand why our bodies age, why our brain connections die. And with that knowledge, we will be able to find a way to not let that happen. We will create Amrit. We will create the drink of the gods in our own laboratories. So is that it? Are we done? Should I just go into the biochemical reactions that will make this elixir possible? Oh, no, right? That's, that's pretty boring for most people. And really, that's not the point of this talk. Instead, I want to urge you to come with me and expand what it means to live forever. Expand your idea of immortality. See, even if we make the omelet and we give it to everybody, we still will not have found true immortality because omelet will only preserve your current body. When Vishnu's female avatar, Mohini, when she gave omelet to the devas, they all drank it and they all could live forever. They could live forever, but they didn't because there were still fights and killing and wars. You see, even if we can prevent your body from aging, it will continue to get damaged. Anything from a paper cut or an infection 
or a car accident or an electric shock or a hurricane or a world war, or whatever it may be, it can lead to your death. You won't be immortal. So then what is true immortality? How can we live forever regardless of all these infections and wars and other things? And here, let me introduce you to transhumanism. Almost every school educated person will have come across the word transcendentalism at some point. Even if you forgot what it means, you probably heard of it at some point. Transhumanism is less familiar. It's an idea that we can grow beyond our human selves. An idea that our consciousness, our soul, who we are, is not defined by our physical body alone. An idea that our consciousness, our soul, who we are, is not defined by our physical body alone. In fact, many of us are born Hindu and, and we, we respect the Hindu philosophy this idea of transhumanism is the basis for all Hindu philosophy. You know, when I was a child reading books, I read about the spiritual masters and rishis living thousands of years. We believe that Krishna and Ram and others are also here with us. We feel their presence in our prayers and thoughts, even though their bodies have far decomposed somewhere beneath the earth. In the same way, we feel the love of our mother, the teachings of our guru, the presence of our father, despite their bodies having all passed away. In fact, in the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna explains the reality of the universe, he explains the whole philosophy of karma and reincarnation, all of which rests on the fact that your soul does not die at the end when your body dies. Krishna says to Arjuna, as a person puts on new garments and sheds the old one, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. As a person puts up new garments and sheds the old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. Krishna also says, the wise grieve neither for those who live nor for those who die, for life and death both shall pass away. Me and you and all souls have been here for all of time. And we shall be there for all time, forever and ever. The enlightened ones, like Krishna, remember their past lifetimes, but we don't. So we get stuck in one life after another. In modern philosophy, this thought is called transhumanism. It's just a different word. You know, in, in the text, in the Vedas, in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's karma and reincarnation. In the modern philosophy, it's transhumanism. Transhumanism is the idea that there is something that survives even after your body ages and dies. And it's the belief that we, like Krishna, like our gurus, like the rishis, like so many other people, we can somehow connect with that inner spirit. It's an idea that we as humans can connect with that inner spirit and become truly immortal. We can come to a state where dying, being killed, being poisoned, or whatever else, all of it would just be as if we fell asleep and woke up again. Just like you don't forget who you were yesterday before sleeping, you won't forget who you were in the previous lifetimes. Your bodies may change, but you, your personality, your identity, your consciousness, 
will be immortal, truly immortal. Let me share a quote with you from Julian Huxley. He's the father of the transhumanism movement. He says, up until now, human life has generally been, as Hobbes described it, nasty, brutish, and short. The great majority of human beings, if they have not already died young, have been afflicted with disease and misery. We can justifiably hold the belief that a land of possibility exists a land of possibility where our present limitations and miserable frustrations of our existence could be enlarged, surmounted. That human, that human species can, if it wishes, transcend itself, not just sporadically, an individual here in one way, an individual there in another way, but in its entirety as all of humanity. The human species can, if it wishes, transcend itself, not just sporadically, an individual here in one way, an individual there in one way, but in its entirety as all of humanity. Imagine if all of humanity lived as if they were one with the spirit, as if they were one with Krishna. If all of humanity lived as if they were Krishna, in a singularity, one with God. The question is, how? How can we accomplish things? You know, the person who asks if, or can we, or is it possible? is asking useless questions. Let me take a little digression because I love this icon, which summarizes the grand idea behind Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek is a TED Talk speaker who took the business world by storm with this idea. It's very simple. We often know what we want. In this case, we want to live forever. We also many times know why we want it. We want to enjoy our grandkids. We want to see new experiences. We basically not dying is strong enough reason in itself. But many people spend their lives thinking, is it possible? Can it be done? Am I worthy enough to have this when all these spiritual masters I see around me are dead? And a host of other completely useless questions. The only the one and only question you should be asking yourself at this point is how. How can we make this happen? And really, it works in every field. You want a million dollars. You know why you want it. Stop asking useless questions. The only question you should be asking is how you can get that million dollars and then get to work. You want a nice home, a nice car, a nice vacation. Again, stop asking whether you can have it or not, or if you deserve it, or who can have it or other random things. Just write down how exactly can you make those things happen and get to work. And it applies here too. You want to be immortal. You want to live forever. Instead of debating whether you think this is possible, let me show you how far we've already come. Let me take a minute to show you a video now. Okay, hopefully you can see it. It has no sound, but just watch the video. Did you see it? What was so special in that video? We even without the sound. You know, let's watch it again. It's only about 30 seconds long. We'll watch it again one more time. 
See if you can spot what I'm talking about. Did you see it? This man's name is Pinchas Gutter. As a young child, he was forced into a German Nazi concentration camp. Out of six brothers, he's the only one who survived and moved to Canada. He has spoken to many, many different audiences about the Holocaust and his experiences on death and, and everything horrible that happened in those concentration camps to his family. This particular video clip shows Gutter speaking to a group of students at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. He shares his story for a couple of minutes and then takes questions from the audience, similar to what I'm doing today. But the interesting thing is, Pinch's Gutter is not actually there. In fact, he's probably dead. This is him. Years before that actual clip that I showed you, this is him. He is surrounded by over 8,000 cameras that track every movement of his arms, every wrinkle in his face, every blink of his eye. Scientists students and lay people ask him thousands upon thousands of questions day after day for months straight. He wears the same clothes every day, gets the same haircut, shaves the same way every day and sits in that chair for 12 to 16 hours every day answering their questions over and over again. Every word every motion, every time he laughs, every time he cries, every time he does anything. It's all recorded and analyzed by powerful supercomputers. For 12 to 16 hours a day, every day for months on end, these supercomputers analyze him. After that, they make a digital impression of him almost as if creating an avatar. Except this avatar is not the emoji on your phone. Instead, it looks exactly like the person himself. Same height, same clothes, same facial expression, same language, same personality, same accent, same wrinkles, even down to the same fingerprints. He moves and speaks exactly as the real person. But that's not enough. Because what they're creating or trying to create is not a robot. Despite the thousands of questions and answers that this man answers every day, there is no possible way that you can predict every single question that anyone ever may ever ask him in the future. There is no way to do that. And so here is where the genius comes in. Let's take a step back. To understand it, let's take a simpler example, okay? Let's look in your closet. If I could look at every shirt that you own, every shirt that you have ever owned from your child to now and analyze how many times you wore that shirt, what you felt wearing that shirt, how many times you washed it, whether you wore it to work or the gym, whether you wore it in the evenings or in the mornings, whether you bought it or somebody gifted to you, what shirts you looked at before buying this one, and on and on and on for every single shirt in your closet. 
if I can analyze all this data over all your lifetime, every t-shirt store you visited, every shirt you've looked at, why you chose this one, out of the ones that you have, which one you wear most, which one you don't like, how you feel wearing them, all of that data, do you think I could pick with some probability, with some certainty, the color of a shirt that you would like? You know, we like to think that we're all special, but as humans, we're creatures of habit. And whether you believe it or not, companies like Amazon, Alibaba, Google, and others are using this type of big data to find the shirt that you would like. There's a reason why you see the ads on your phone. And you know, it's not that good because the systems that we have today don't have enough data to analyze. For example, you may have looked around a few shirts and bought one or two on Amazon. That's all that computer knows. And so it sends you to a couple of shirts, some of which you may like, some of which you don't. It's the best guess given that very limited data. But what if it knew everything about all the shirts you ever had? It may surprise you, but if Amazon had all of that data, Amazon could send you the exact shirt that you would have wanted to buy without you doing anything. The video clip that I showed you is not a recording. It's not a robot. It's very important to realize what we're trying to make here. It's not some robot that, or, and, or a recording somewhere that answers lots of questions. And then every time someone asks him a question, that particular recording is played again. No, that's not what we're trying to do. The supercomputers have created an avatar that not only looks and moves like the real person, but also thinks like the real person. He answers questions that he was never asked before. And he answers them perfectly in the same exact manner as the real person would have. With the same words, the same stories, and even the same facial expressions that the real person would have answered had the real person been there. This is true artificial intelligence. This is artificial life. And yes, that digital version of you, that avatar, that one is truly immortal. That digital avatar can never die. Moreover, that you can never be killed. No missile can touch it. No hurricane can erase it. It will live forever, regardless of what happens. Now, just to make sure, we are in the very, very infancy of this idea, of making this idea a reality. Even with the 8,000 computers and, uh, sorry, 8,000 cameras and the huge supercomputers, we can only get that digital pinch of Gunter to sit in one same spot and wear the same clothes and answer questions related to one topic related to the Holocaust. It's far from real life. It's a long way from creating a true digital representation of everything that makes up who you are. But that doesn't mean it cannot be done. At the Microsoft Research Center, there are two people, Gordon Bell and Jim Gray, that have an idea. And here's the very basic. You see, the guy in the video clip was only doing this for a few months. But what if we could record every single conversation from a person from their birth all the way to the end of life? We could take a newborn baby and surgically put a microphone inside its mouth so anytime he ever says anything, it will be recorded. We could put devices in his ear similar to our hearing aids that, so that anything anyone ever says to him will also be recorded. We can put cameras the size of contact lenses in both of his eyes 
So anything he ever sees will also be recorded. And we could give him an iPhone that records every location he's ever been to, every article he's read, every message he's sent, every social media post he's liked, every click he's pressed online. All of it will be recorded for his entire human life. In fact, just out of curiosity, these two people at Microsoft Research calculated exactly how much storage space the files from this recording would take. Do you want to know? One terabyte. One terabyte, that's it. Everything that your body, that you in this world sees, hears, speaks, can be recorded on a flash drive. But that's all only part of the story, right? Because if it was that easy, you would have done it already. As many of you know, the point isn't the data. Big data is available everywhere nowadays. But it's how to analyze it. That's the key. Could we analyze all that data, those millions of conversations, the billions of social media posts, the hours and days and years of a human life? Could we analyze all of it? And then could we create a digital avatar that looks, acts, speaks, walks, thinks, and goes through life exactly as if you were. Could we create a digital avatar that will do this forever, that is immune to poisons and killings, even if the earth went dry, the avatar would still live and will live long after he died. It will be digitally immortal. This is a game. It's a video game that's there today. This video game is called Sims. When you enter this game, you choose a player. You can be a male, a female, an organism. You can be fat, you can be skinny, you can have blonde hair, you can have black hair, you can be bald. You can do whatever you want. You can play tennis, you can play beer pong, you can go to college, you can do whatever it is you wanna do with that avatar. But the key is, instead of all the video games that we think about and, and we may have played in our, in our lifetimes where we were playing as one person and on all the other people were just random computers that we were playing against, in this game, every avatar that you see is an actual live person. All the other characters are real human beings that have logged in somewhere into the game with their own avatars. They move independently by what the human being tells them. There is no algorithm, there is nothing. So when you interact with them, even the computer or nobody knows how that interaction is gonna go. Just like in real life, if you had met that person. Today, we control these avatars with a mouse and a keyboard. But could we create this digital version, this digital avatar of you directly? Could we implant your consciousness directly into these avatars? And then could we create a bedroom for that avatar, a playground, a school, a job, a wife, all virtual? It will be like creating a video game. Only all the characters can think and be independent and have ideas and mm -hmm. live and build things and choose and have free will. And the avatar can go into one character for a period of time and then shed that character away and choose another life to live almost like the avatar itself becomes a soul and creates its own avatar, but then will question their existence, just like we're doing today. 
something about all this reminds me about Maya. I mean, it seems very similar to the ancient texts that say that our world is built in some way like this. They write that God or Brahma or, or some other being from a different dimension created this world where we just live. And he gave us souls that pass on to bodies, almost like we're all inside a video game. But I just wanna say something here that I said last time. Ideas go from philosophy to psychology to real physics and neuroscience. This talk is not about philosophy. It's not just about ideas. I am not a philosopher. I am not a neuroscientist. Sorry, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a uh, psychologist. I am a neuroscientist. I have no interest in questions like could we? What I am interested in is how can we make it happen? Remember, ask the right question. Here we get to the topic of this talk, Becoming Digitally Immortal by 2045. The title is not Becoming Digitally Immortal. It's Becoming Digitally Immortal by 2045. We today not only believe that this can happen, but we plan to make it happen by 2045. Let me introduce you to Dmitry Itzkov. Itzkov. Dmitry writes, my mission is to create technology enabling transfer of an individual's personality to a non-biological carrier and extending existence, including to the point of immortality. My mission is to create technology enabling transfer of an individual's personality to a non-biological carrier and extend existence, including to the point of immortality. There's a Wikipedia page called the 2045 Initiative. There's a website, 2045.com. There's a $10 million prize currently out there for the first person who can build a robot that, we, that can see, hear, and feel. The race is already on. Similar projects are now coming up all over the think tanks of Apple and Facebook. Google has announced that it will create a way to talk to your grandmother like you talk to Siri on your iPhone long after your grandmother has passed away. Your grandchildren can, grandchildren, will be able to talk to her and ask her questions and interact with her long after she's dead. Even major government institutions, including the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation are investing heavily in these technologies. And of course, all of this pales in comparison to the experiments carried on right now at the Department of Defense in the secret robotics laboratories of the United States military. Can you imagine a digital you that can fight wars, that can conquer nations, all the while remaining immortal? Our ancient texts imagine devas, imagine these beings that transcend mortality, these devas. With Vishnu's Mohini and her Amrit, they led lives of luxury and waged war and had all the pleasures of life without for a moment worrying about their death. 5,000 years later, we are done imagining. We are moving those ideas from philosophy and psychology to physics and neuroscience. We are creating Amrit. We are quite literally going to start creating gods. But there's still one problem. The problem is what happens to you, the living, breathing, physical you. When you become a digital avatar, yes, that digital you can live forever. For everyone else interacting with that digital you, there will be no difference. Your digital you will look like you, will dress like you, will have choices like you, will have a personality like you, 
will do everything exactly like you. For someone, for anyone who interacts with you, it will just be you. But for you, it will be different. What about you? The you that's still trapped inside this aging body. This talk has been about becoming digitally immortal. But as it turns out, there are many other ways to achieve immortality. Remember Simon Sinek's circle of why, how, and what? Turns out, in between the why and the what, there are many different hows, many different paths that all lead to Rome, that all lead to immortality. I've just talked about one path here today, the path of digital immortality. But I just want to give you a sneak peek. I want to show you this video. Only 40 seconds, it has no sound. This is the path to immortality, a different path using cyborg robots. Remember last week, I said that your brain processes so many calculations that it would take the world's fastest supercomputer four hours to do the things that your brain does in one second? Well, then why use super supercomputers? Why not just use your brain that's inside your skull, inside your head, why not just use that brain itself? These researchers literally took a rat, went in, dissected out its brain, and put it in a jar of fluid. And soon, they hope to do so in humans. No reason to transfer consciousness, no transfer of memory, no digitally uploading, no creating avatars, no transferring anything. Literally you, the physical you, the biological you, but only your brain, not your aging, dying body, just taking your brain, the brain, the connections that make you you, taking that out from your dying body and keeping it in a jar of nutrient and oxygen-rich fluid that will never let it die, locking it in an impenetrable safe that will never let it be destroyed. And from there, having Bluetooth and Wi-Fi signals go around controlling robots in the physical world. That's what this robot represents. This is a rat that was that was a rat, that is still a rat, who has a brain as a rat, and the brain of a rat is stored in a freezer thousands of miles away. And the signals from that brain are communicated to this robot, and the rat moves this robot wherever it wants to go. If this robot dies, if something happens, if the wheels fall off, they simply just take all those signals and transfer it to another robot. Just like you would, if your avatar dies, if your robot dies, you would just take control of another one and go on to another life. Here I'm reminded of Krishna's words. Krishna says, as a person puts on new garments and sheds old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. This is our reality. And so I only have one last question for you. Are you excited? I know it's been a long talk, 
I just want to ask, are you excited? This talk is, be, uh, is on becoming digitally immortal. It's fun to think about this and all the other types of immortality that we will soon be able to achieve. And I already know that some of you will criticize me on dreaming a little further, on drawing conclusions now for things that we won't know will happen for another few decades. But overall, I hope this talk was enjoyable. I hope it introduced you to a concept of becoming digitally mortal. And more than that, more than just the idea, I hope it shared with you all the advances that we're doing right now that are ongoing in our laboratories to make this a real possibility. And, you know, the main reason, I hope that at some level, it inspired you to appreciate everything, to appreciate what all our fellow human beings are doing to advance our species beyond the mundane reality of life and death. When the gods created us, I'm not talking about uh, the Krishna and Brahma and, and God in that sense, a universal being, but these lesser devas, when they created us, when they took the Amrit away from us, you know, they subjected us to a meaningless life, a life that you live for a few years and you die. But today, I'd like to just tell them that we're coming. We're becoming immortal. We are literally creating gods. And I hope it inspired you to appreciate everything we're our, all our fellow human beings are doing to advance our species, to appreciate everything that we are doing to take human beings into the realm of God. And so with that, I really want to thank the Atharde Foundation for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. You know, I am so inspired by the work you guys do every day and how much you give selflessly for others because these are still just ideas. We are not there yet. For now, people are suffering. And your donations to charity and your service to a community are truly, truly commendable. So thank you so much for having me here. And just a reminder that if anyone does want to connect with me, I'm usually pretty good at checking Twitter and Instagram. And I would absolutely love to hear what you thought about today's talk. This is also my last time with you. So hopefully you enjoyed all the talks in the last few Sundays. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to maybe see you again virtually or uh, even more, I hope, I uh, will be able to meet you one day in person. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Amit, uh, for such a <clears throat> exceptionally uh, wonderful you know, presentation and the thought process where the medical science and the technology working hand in hand together to make <clears throat> technically digitally immortal possible. Um, I still remember like a few Thank years you. before uh, when I first time came across this concept of Microsoft HoloLens where the Microsoft engineers recorded all the sessions and he's enjoying uh, the birthday you know, cutting the cake of his, with his daughter on birthday, where he was like 10,000 miles away, where his daughter feels that my dad is still with him. So, uh, and I think you brought the same thing up here. But yeah, this is, this is completely different. <clears throat> the subject was uh, totally different and innovative. Uh, it opens up a lot of uh, new thought process for everyone. Um, and we can take questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Exceptionally good. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for saying that. <clears throat> so here is a first statement. <clears throat> explored, a, explored a new topic which was not thought and not known to me, although we do work in sentimental analysis and AI. Thank you both, you, Amit, and to the pages to message. Thanks a lot, Amit. Thank you very, very much. Very Thank interesting you. thought, yeah. And then, yes. So I, I'm opening this for any questions for the people who <clears throat> who, who would like who are the you know 
some type of different expectation or this new thought that you know that thought process is coming uh, if you have any any doubts or any research related information or questions which amit is working or is his team or other people in this world are working on it if you have any questions please open up <clears throat> so before someone comes in i have a question you can type in or you know that would be an easier uh, so before anyone else uh, join, you know, take this question, I mean, I have a question. So you put across here the two different thoughts. One is being digitally immortal by purely by creating your avatar. And second is by actually protecting the physical, biological brain that can actually drive what you become, where are you become, like and become a robot kind of thing. Is that is correct, right? That's what you thought. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, the first one is what I spent a lot of time on because that's what we had agreed to as, as the topic. Um, there's a lot more to say about protecting the human brain and actually making the brain live forever, the actual physical brain, um, but maybe another day. But yeah, those are the two paths. There's also other paths, um, which I'd be happy to explore another day. But yeah, there's lots of ways to get there, it turns out. So. Mm -hmm. But can, can it be the same, I mean, you know, emotional experience? Do you think that we can, I mean, is that possible? It, it, can, it can be exactly the same emotional experience. And that's what is so phenomenal about this. You... So let me ask you this, right? If I touch your hand and I tell you to close your eyes and I touch your hand, what you're feeling is not the hand that's being touched. It's the nerve that carries the information of touching your hand all the way to your brain and the brain feels it. When I simulate this into an avatar and touch the avatar's hand, I can replicate the same signal into your brain and your brain will feel as if you're touching your own hand. And this is actually already done. This is not even an idea. This is actually done in uh, robotics where people unfortunately lose arms, lose legs, go to war, and they have prosthetic devices. Many of you will have just seen the prosthetic devices as like, oh, okay, they can move and stuff. Um, but right now we have prosthetic devices that can feel as if it was your leg. Like if you step in water, they'll, you'll feel wet. If you step on fire, you'll feel hot. Um, so yeah, it will feel exactly the same way as if someone's talking to you, feeling you, touching you, things mm -hmm. like that. Thanks, uh, this is exceptionally, exceptionally uh, amazing. So is there another uh, question or statement that me read? Great thought. Uh, provisioning session, uh, Dr. Amit uh, could not thank you enough. My question is, there any specific research project going on and will it be possible to be on the update list? There are so many. Um, the uh, first one to check out would be under the, um, so as I mentioned, there's a couple of different initiatives. I know I talked a lot about the 2045 initiative. Um, if you just go to 2045.com, you will see a bunch of research projects there. You will see a bunch of prizes being awarded um, for people who conduct research in this project. This initiative is a private initiative. And so it is nonprofit, but it is a private one. So it's limited. Um, the larger ones can be found in the National Science Foundation, which is the United States Fund for all scientific adventure that happened. Um, and I can share those links as well. Um, but just realize they, they, sometimes, uh, you know, it's the information is it's available, but sometimes it's hidden because even sometimes I have difficulty understanding exactly what they're doing. So if you have difficulty identifying these projects or where they are, how, how you can help or something, I'm very happy to help you in any way that I can uh, to reach out to the people doing them and, and give you a list of projects and, and kind of explain in a more simple language of what they're doing. But yeah, those ex this exist, they're out there and I'm happy to share them with you. Thank you, Dr. Mitch. So here's the next question. Sometimes we say like a telepathy when you think of it and it happens. 
uh, or you want to phone and person uh, phone me. Uh, so, or intuition or something, some connections. So I think uh, Dr. Mangala is making a statement. Yeah. Is there any question? Yeah. Yeah. I think she, what she's referring to is uh, tele telepathy. I don't know if there's a question on but I, I just like to say something about telepathy. So telepathy is a completely different talk. And honestly, I could talk for like an hour about telepathy. It, this is the feeling where the we in, in our hospitals, there's people who say that, oh, my child is in an accident and they come to our hospital, the child comes to hospital and we call their parents and the mom says, I felt it. I felt that something happened to my child. And it's not possible, right? The, the, the mom wasn't with them. There was no connection. He didn't call her or anything like that. So physically under our current laws or things that we can imagine, we think that it's not possible. However, the new research in quantum physics says that it is possible, says that there is some way that this could actually happen, that thoughts could be transferred without just language communicating between me and you. And, and you know, if you read the olden times, they say that gurus would just sit there and all the students would learn from the gurus without saying a word to each other. This is actually possible, and I'm sorry, I'm just spending a lot of time on it because I really love this topic of telepathy. Um, in fact, when Einstein was asked about this about 70 years ago, he, he called it very famously spooky action at a distance. And if you Google that exact phrase, spooky action at a distance, it's something that Einstein never understood. It's something that quantum mechanics is on the verge of understanding. And it's a way to transfer thoughts and ideas so much faster. For example, you don't have to write textbooks. You can just sit around a person and get all the knowledge from them. And so it's possible, but not related to this conversation, not related to the immortality. Perfect. So um, there is uh, there is there are two more questions, but before that, I have my own questions. So I'll take it you know, an opportunity to plug in. So do you think this uh, uh, Einstein's E is equal to MC square? Would that be uh, is would that be in the future would be possible? Where we'd say oh the you know in the or old literature or Veda we say the, you know transfer uh, like you know God moves from one first phase to another phase. So that's actually the E is equal to so is would that be possible with the physical body? I mean with that. Yeah, I think you know he he showed it in mathematically that energy does include mass times speed of light squared, right? But if you think about it, speed of light is very, very fast. Okay. Think of let's say you have a marble and you want to take that marble to the speed of light. We, we still can't do it, first of all, but it would take an enormous energy to get there, to move that marble that fast. Now you have to move it squared. That means the speed of light times the speed of light. That is incredibly fast that you have to move this marble in order to convert it into pure energy, right? Because E equals MC squared. To get to energy, you have to take some mass, move it at that rapid speed to convert it into, into energy. The problem is, our current universe, there is an unspoken law that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So how can some mass travel faster than C squared? How can you know, some mass travel at C squared? How can something travel more than the speed of light? But again, this spooky action at a distance, which he never understood, it does. It influences things galaxies away in milliseconds where light from those galaxies would take years and years and years to come and see us. I mean, when you look up, let's say you look at the sun, you're looking at the sun, how it was eight minutes ago, because it takes like eight minutes to reach you. When you look at a star, you're looking at what that star was several hundreds of years ago, because it takes that long for the light from there to reach you. However, with this spooky action, with quantum mechanics, there is a way where some information and some thing can be communicated to that star at that rate. And so, yes, it is possible to, to convert and to make that mathematical reality 
Um, but we are nowhere close to that yet. So that's all. I'm not a physicist, but that's what I understand and know about it that much. Thanks. So here's the next question. Are you more inclined towards philosophy? I think philosophy is inherent in everything you do. <clears throat> you know, people termed philosophy as like just a study of ideas and people think, oh, Aristotle and, you know, Gandhi had a philosophy. Oh, sorry, I forgot to unmute. <clears throat> um, so I think everything is philosophy, as I was saying. Uh, people think of Aristotle having philosophy, Gandhi having a philosophy, but everything you do is a philosophy. Right? Everything you're, you think about it in the very simplest form, everything, every action that people see off you is a behavior. That's something that you did. You picked up a glass, you went to school, you did something. The reason why you did that behavior is philosophy, right? You went to school because you believe in education. You uh, got married because you believe in a human society that functions well when you're married. So in that sense, yes, I believe that philosophy drives everything that we do. But don't stop at philosophy. Don't be the person who believes in blind faith. Don't be the person who just accepts things for what they are. So. Yeah, the question is a yes and no. I love philosophy, but I, I think that there is more to science than there is more than, than philosophy. So here's the next question. Uh, will it treat the patients having different type of diseases? So there, there's two types of mortality I shared with you. There's a couple other types where, where you can just focus on disease specific um, treatments. The two that I shared with you, you will never have a disease. Think about any disease that you ever know about and think that it never exists because your digital avatar will never have a disease and, and neither will a brain protected in this container. So you're not just talking about eliminating suffering, eliminating disease. You're talking about eliminating all disease forever. And if you, I don't know if you were here in my first talk where I was talking about what's between life and death. One of the things that I really stressed is I have no interest, or at least I'm not capable enough, like many of you are, in helping the individual, helping individual suffering, helping one government, one identity. What we are talking about is eliminating all suffering, all diseases, every possible bad thing. Of course, there'll still be emotional suffering because your avatars will be like you. They'll fall in love, they'll fall out of love, they'll face all of these other things, but disease in the way that it impairs your body will just not be a concept anymore. So the next question is a prediction intuition uh, started with diaper and peer theory. It's very small for me. We have definitely hoped to attend the lecture subject digital immortality in 2045. Uh, that's great. I'm actually not familiar myself with the diaper and beer theory, but after this, I will look into it. Um, I will research it and uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, maybe I will learn something as well. Okay, so. There are no questions for that. Um, let me interrupt, sir. I have one more question. Sure. Uh, uh, Dr. Amit Choudhury, he had really very extraordinary topic. Uh, and uh, my question is that he began with the concept of immortality by taking into gamma to the, its a history. And so far as my understanding goes uh, by his lecture, that the concept of immortality, it got out of ignorance first, and uh, it must be out of fear of death, okay? And uh, naturally, it evoked the question in my mind, uh, as a neurologist, he considers neural signals and that neural uh, connections as a person and consciousness, as a personality in totality, okay? And now for extraordinary geniuses, 
as uh, you discussed like einstein is okay and again for extraordinary uh, people like capitalist and big guns politicians it's okay but what is the relevance for commoners of this concept i mean uh, why the hell science should uh, utilize such concepts for commoners like me because today we have accepted that after 70 years or at least so 75 or 80 that we are going to end our avatars and within that limited space and scope we have to finish all our duties responsibilities and uh, we are going to pass our personality genetically at least as our heirs and then we are going to leave them alone uh, vanishing our existence Uh, this is the acceptance now we have accepted it but why are you creating hopes in commoners in masses such a very dangerous ideas and hopes why are you seeding among ourselves what's the reason what's the motive i have no motive if you have accepted death as a form of life and um accepted it as it will come then um i have no motive uh, you're you're welcome to not take any of these paths it is like saying um you know if you accept your current situation for example if you accept i live in a very small apartment okay i can show it to you right now it's literally where i'm sitting my couch and uh, a dining table and and a bed uh, where currently my wife is and that's it it's it's four walls there's no room there's one bathroom if i accept that this is my life and i'm very content and very happy then i have no reason to go for a bigger plane a bigger apartment or to buy a car or like uh, go for a house or make more money or do anything right so i ask you why are you uh, struggling what makes you struggle All right so you may go to work every day i'm not sure if you do or not or or may you may be retired or or something else but let's suppose that you go to work every day why do you do that are you accepting of your current reality are you accepting that you're going to stay in this one location and this is the only thing you're going to go to work make a certain amount of money and be happy in that life then that's that's all the power to you and that's a really good way to live in fact it's probably a very healthy very mature and very fulfilled way to live but some of us are not at that enlightened phase yet there is i would love to talk to you about enlightenment true enlightenment has nothing to do with immortality i feel like i'm just saying more lectures here but i don't mean to take more of your time enlightenment the way that buddha experienced it is full joy it's a feeling and if you have accepted it if you have if you are at that point where you are enlightened enough to say that yes i am me and i am going to live and i'm going to die i'm going to be part of this some some sky and this life and this a uh, community there is a very very enlightened way to live in fact i think if i brought this proposal to the buddha he probably would not be interested right but many of us are not there and so we suffer we fear death we um, are near humans we have not accepted that we should die we have not i have not accepted that this is the only reality for me in these four walls even if the four walls are saying my mind is out of this four walls because that's not what i want and for us we will never be satisfied as you mentioned these ancient texts they really the the one of the first thing they say is desire is the thing that makes us unsatisfied it makes us um unhappy because we can never fulfill all desires the second that i go from this one little apartment that i have to a bigger house i would want to live in bigger house and when i get there i'll want to even bigger one and from there an even bigger one and so we will never be satisfied so you know enlightenment as you're describing it it's it's completely different topic it it will take me a long time to address it but uh, for now i just want to say if you're not interested in living forever um then there's no reason for you to 
there will be a lot of people where, who will pass away between now and, and when we start living forever. This will all be voluntary. Um, but if you are somebody who wants to talk to your children's grandchildren, if you want to spend time in looking at the iPhone 135, if you want to explore other universes, if you want to go to Mars, if you want to see what technology is coming out, if you want to experience what you have not experienced yet, then I can make a way for you to make it possible. Because the guy who's already dead will never see the iPhone 14. And maybe he doesn't need to, maybe he doesn't care. He's like, okay, well, I've accepted that I'm going to die today before the iPhone 14 comes out or the 15 comes out or 16 comes out. For me personally, I, I don't wanna accept that reality. I wanna see all the versions. I wanna see everything. I wanna to go to Mars. I wanna to go to the nearest star. I wanna see people being born. I wanna see everything. And you know, it may not happen in my lifetime. It, it may not happen to me in my lifetime. Maybe this will be just restricted to the politicians and the rich people that you, that you uh, talk about, but eventually it's coming. And uh, that's the reason why I'm hopeful that it's coming and that why I spend all of my time in making sure that it comes. My God, Dr. Amit, you explained it very nicely and I don't know how much greater scientist you are, but you are really a great uh, philosopher as well. I would really like to Thank see you. you once again. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir, I'm Ashish. You. I'm Ashish Patil. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so, I have a few questions to ask to Amit uh, in a particular sequence. Uh, my first question is, uh, do you believe in God? You, okay, um, this is a very weighted question because what um, many people have asked me this and I want to just clarify, okay? Some people ask me, do you believe in God? And they refer to a, an entity of physical being that controls the universe. Some people have a very different concept of God that is under is prevalent in every cell, every atom of every universal thing and directs what atoms do. So what do you mean when you say God? And I can answer your question. I mean to say that whatever you have explained in this session regarding immortal, digital immortality. So I, uh, with my perspective, I took it as a, Let's say this technology is proving, probably may prove the existence of God as well. Correct. Because, so, <clears throat> because I'm sorry, I, uh, because, yeah. because when we link it with, let's say now the Krishna consciousness moment is there. Okay. So people with their own way, uh, by doing the Bhakti Yoga, they are trying to connect with each and every uh, uh, God they worship. Okay, so uh, how we can relate with this God concept? Sounds good. I, I, I think I understand a little bit um, and forgive me if I don't understand completely, but I wanna share with you my, um, my favorite painting of all time. You may or may not have heard of it. There is a painting that was made where um, there's earth and there's a man sitting on this earth and he points upwards and, and there's a sky and there's a person, uh, a, a God figure in the sky and he points down and both of their fingers are almost touching. And in that painting, what is symbolized is that's the time when man grew conscious, where he found himself, where he realized that, hey, I am a human being, okay? Before that, the body of the man existed. The animals existed. We existed as like the cat and the cockroach and everything. But what made us conscious was this touch from God. That were the, the exact point where they touched in the very famous painting. And what I want to share with you is I, you know, this, this is controversial, but I believe that to be somewhat true. I don't, so I, I believe in evolution. I just put it out there. I'm not going anti-evolution on you. 
I did believe that our bodies take, did take millions of years and everything. But why is it that the cat that's been living for millions of years as well, why did it not develop this consciousness? Why didn't the monkey, why didn't somebody else? I believe that there is a certain power in the universe that was, that came into our non-physical body. And you can call it the soul, you can call it an avatar, you can call it God, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Um, but I believe that our bodies existed long before this power came into us. And it is because of this power that we become human, that we realize that we are alive. Um, otherwise, we're just cats and dogs running around. So I hope that answers your question in a little bit. When you say, do I believe in God? Uh, I call me a romantic, but yeah, to some extent, that is my version of God. And yes, I believe in it. And yes, I believe that we can connect to that inner spirit. Uh, I call it the spirit. And some people call it uh, Krishna, Bhakti Yoga. I'm aware of all of these philosophies. Uh, but I call it your inner spirit. And I believe that you can connect to that inner spirit. Will that give you immortality? Very likely. I think this is what the Buddha and, and especially the Buddha taught. I don't know about other people, but... I'm sure they did as well, but the Buddha specifically taught that by going inside and connecting to this inner spirit, he remembered all of his lifetime. He remembered his past, he remembered everything up to this day, and he could see his future as well. I mean, that is another concept of immortality. And he did that not through technology, not through what we're doing, but simply through connecting to that inner spirit. I believe that's possible, uh, but again, you know, I, uh, I will be very criticized for it, I know, um, because science has not showed anything that, that is possible, but uh, it's a matter of belief. And, and to answer your question, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. I, I got your point. Actually, I asked this question because I'm aware that, uh, for example, in Maharashtra, there is a, uh, uh, there, there is a Alandi, Okay, in a, at Alandi, Santa Naneshwara took the Sanjeevan Samadhi, so alive Samadhi. Okay, so as per the Nobel Klaise research, also in India, there are 162 divine energy, cosmic energy spots, and uh, Alandi is one of them. So when we go to Alandi and uh, you know try to meditate there, try to connect with uh, let's say the great sage Saint Santa Naneshwara, so I mean to say that uh, with our uh, purification with our consciousness. Is it possible to connect with the Santad Naneshwara? So I'm trying to correlate this concept with the digital immortality. As you said that we can be immortal, we can be, we can store our memories in the digital form and our upcoming generation can interact with us. So I was just trying to correlate this. So in that regard, I asked these questions. So I hope uh, yeah. my consciousness, I could uh, ask right question, but yeah, you can uh, just elaborate on it if you can. Yeah, I, I won't take too much time, but I think this question came up again. Um, you know, immortality is different from enlightenment. And I just want to make that very clear because somebody else had asked this in the past too. Enlightenment is a, is a different topic and I would love to speak on that. Uh, when you do go to these places and you feel uh, connected with somebody, uh, with the spirit or, or with Krishna or somebody, you're talking about becoming enlightened. You're talking about remembering every, your previous lifetimes, maybe connecting with God in a very specific, different way. Um, I, 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 it would be a different talk I, for me to really delve into your question and the previous guy's question about you know, enlightenment. So. I'll just leave it at that. There's a lot more to be said. Um, but, but yeah, I believe it's possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. I look forward to your next uh, session on enlightenment. Thank you. Well, I, I don't know if that will happen, but yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, someone made a statement. I think that's consciousness and awareness part. Correct. Okay. Any more questions? Any uh, before we close? It's almost one and a half hour. Very interesting, and uh, we couldn't 
figured out that uh, we spent almost 90 minutes. Uh, very interesting topic, uh, Amit. You Good, yeah, well, thank you. I, I know it was a little bit of a longer talk and uh, sorry to keep you beyond your time, but hopefully it was interesting and fun. And, um, you know, I'm happy to, if, if Pramod Anka wants or, or somebody else wants, I'm happy to talk to you on similar topics or different topics in the future. So I really thank you for all your interest because it really, you know, it's, it's so nice that people are actually thinking about these things or at least want to learn about them. Um, so thank you very much. There, really, there, is, really there is a question that. here. There's a question for Mr. Dilip Chaudhary here. He's trying to ask something. He raised a hand. Sir, question over here. Just to me, I interaction with you. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. No problem. Okay. Thank you so much. Very, very nice. Um, it's yes. good to see you. Thank you for turning your camera on. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit. That promotes me. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining this uh, powerful event. Uh, if I think this is Zubin, Dr. Zubin uh, also is on there. Any Anything that you want to make a statement, Dr. Or a question? Nothing in particular. Oh, okay. okay, I just thought like your video on. It is nice to see your face as well. Thank you for turning your camera on. And really, just one last time, I want to say thank you so much to everyone for, for spending your Sundays with me. I am I'm so, so honored that you would spend your time with me. And, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Amit. Thanks uh, on behalf of everyone who joined, and thanks on behalf of Atarde Foundation. Uh, for keeping yourself available. I know you work whole night and then uh, your time zone is you have to wake up early morning, six o'clock, you come from the hospital so early you know, by around six, six thirty, and then attending the session is it's very challenging, it's not easy. But finding out time in your that schedule you. is uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any question, Rajesh? No, I'm you. good. Thank you, Amit. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. It was nice to see you.